I, I'm not sure if I'm <laughs> going to get to the bottom of that question. Um, so, so this is us. Um, um, I'll just give you a bit, of, bit more intro. So we're a global movement for digital freedom. Uh, our mission is to ensure an open global internet and an uncensored and secure digital sphere. Uh, we, do, we basically use three different strategies, which is action, policy and technology to achieve real change, particularly, as I say, for people on the other side of the firewall. Um, and um, we have members in 180 uh, countries. So I wanted to actually start um, with, um, with this because I think that this is the most kind of relevant concept, uh, context for us uh, right now, <coughs> the, the events that are sweeping in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and and uh, because I think that this, these moments that we're, these historical moments that we're living in are like a, 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 a very clear example of the call for transparency and accountability from governments. Um, and, and, and many people have been asking us about like the role of new technology and all of this. And I think there's probably been a similar debate here in Sweden, like how important is new technology to what we've seen in Tahrir Square, for instance. Uh, and I think it's really important that we understand that the call for transparency and for accountability and for an end to corruption and to the concentration of wealth in the hands of a few is, is not from Twitter and it's not from Facebook. It's actually a result of, in, you know, in, Egypt, in Egypt's case, decades of, um, of, of um, crushing poverty and unemployment and a sense of helplessness. But I do think that technology has been the kind of contagion and the accelerator here, the speed with which we've seen, um, um, you know, um, the sort of transformation take place, um, the speed with which we've seen communities linked together that haven't been linked together um, and deliver an outcome, I think is just, you know, is, is stunning. And I think it is definitely t uh, new technology and social media we often talk about social media as like Facebook uh, and Twitter, for instance, but I think one of the issues that's, that's been, one of the mechanisms that not, has not been discussed a lot is just the simple email um, and, and Bluetooth, for instance, as well, and instant messages. So we need to remember some of the sort of older forms of t new technology, not just the social movement stuff. I think the other thing that's happening is in addition to what we've seen here in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, where our concentration is that we're in contact with activists all around the world. This revolution is actually taking place in Tibet and it's taking place in Burma and it's taking place in Vietnam uh, and, and through um, and Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. Like there's actually a similar process that's happening and it's not just happening, also, it's actually happening in the West as well. I think that we've seen radical transformations in the way that um, society uh, relates to government and, I th and, and one of the key things is a reduction, and this is in terms of transparency and I think the role of new technology is the reduction of space between, uh, between citizens and those who govern citizens. I think that reduction in space is really important uh, to understand and I think new technology has played a significant role in that. Um, People often talk about the digital divide as well, like that the world is actually split into two groups. And one of the very significant things that's happened, obviously, is the role of mobile technologies um, and how that's enabled Africa, for instance, to leapfrog uh, and now become part of the digital sphere. So 90% um, so of the world actually has access to, to mobile networks and it's 80% of, pe of people living in, in a rural area. And that's just going to you know, increasingly change, particularly as 3G networks um, uh, expand and people have access to the internet through their mobile handsets. If you think about in China, for instance, there's now 860, mobile, 860 million mobile handsets. So you can imagine what kind of potential existential threat that poses to the Chinese regime. Uh, and uh, we also, you know, if you think about the way in which regimes try to isolate the individual from each other, how important new technology is, and particularly social networking in demonstrating the shared pain and suffering and ideas that people have amongst the community and the sort of the traditional controls that 
uh, that authoritarian regimes have had in place, like for instance, they own the newspapers, they control the radio, um, they have um, social, socialised systems of control between individuals. The social networks and new technology actually dissolves a lot of that and I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing governments spending so much money in the digital sphere, like so much money, why particularly regimes, closed and semi-closed governments, are spending so much money in trying to manage it because they can see what the potential of, um, of it is. Uh, again, I want to stress that it's not, I'm not saying that new technology is the cause. Um, I'm saying that it's the accelerator. Um, so um, there's some, some further images here, which I think it's, I mean, we've seen a lot of this stuff, but I think it's really very powerful, um, particularly when you get to speak to some of these people and the experiences that they have of being in Tahrir Square, um, of facing the military uh, and the security services. Uh, in terms of transparency, it's obviously not just here, as I mentioned, uh, and I think Julian Assange's WikiLeaks has kind of really put the issue of transparency onto the agenda in my country and in your country, obviously in particular, but all over the world. Uh, and I don't know if people have read his, his writings, there's actually, like there's a philosophy behind all of this. It's not just about, um, you know, radical transparency um, to no end. He talks about the kind of the conspiracy of government um, and, and its relationship with the population, about the control of information and the radical steps that he sees are needed in order to release that information, to liberate that information. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's based on, pr on principles that, um, you know, that information creates accountability. And if you look at these two quotes, you can see one is from Barack Obama and the other one is from Julian Assange. Um, I might just read them because they're, they're interesting. The way to make government responsible is to hold it accountable. And the way to make government accountable is make it transparent so that the American people, and I think it relates to everybody, can know exactly what decisions are being made, how they're being made, and whether their interests are being uh, well served. So this is kind of from an you know, from an institutional perspective. On the opposite, um, to radically shift regime behaviour, we must think clearly and boldly, for if we have learned anything, it is that regimes do not want to be changed. We must think beyond those who have gone before us and discover technological changes that embolden us with ways to act in which our forebears could not. So, um, <clears throat> you know, there really isn't, as I'm seeing it, uh, an unstoppable appetite um, for data. And the interesting thing is that there are new mechanisms to make that happen. And I want to talk about some of those mechanisms, you know, to share, to map, to propagate and to analyse data. Um, <clears throat> and one of them I have been involved with quite a lot, which is, which is GetUp. I used to be the executive director of GetUp, uh, which is a movement of 400,000 people in Australia, which is the equivalent of... Um, I guess it's 200,000 yeah, 200, people here in Sweden because Australia is a double, double the population. Um, no major political decision is made in Australia without GetUp involvement, I would say. Uh, it's basically a movement of citizens who are connected by new technology and is trying to turn inside out the process of government. So uh, many people would say that GetUp has actually influenced the outcome of the last two Australian elections. Uh, they Work For You is a really good example of, um, you know, you stay in contact with the people who you, who you um, elect. And there's probably an ex uh, the equivalent here in Sweden. But essentially, you can keep in contact with every single thing that the person who you put in power does. Their press releases, their decisions, um, the meetings that they go to, you can see their, their funding, uh, who, who funded their campaign and the relationship between um, those who funded them and their policies. So for instance, if they received money from the petroleum industry, how they voted on offshore drilling. Uh, this is data.gov, which is an example of a US, uh, it's a US initiative. It's actually really quite impressive, the amount of data that's been made available by the US government. Um, obviously, there's a huge amount of data that got uh, un, um, 
reluctantly with, uh, taken out of the, of, the, of the government and via WikiLeaks. But there's actually, like, in terms of voluntary disclosure, I think there's really an amazing amount of information. I took that screen grab yesterday because you can see this, kind, this image rotates, but this is about nuclear power reactor inspection reports. And so it's both a compilation of data, data sets that are raw as well. And there's obvious questions about how that data is kind of analysed and the, the conclusions that are drawn from it. Um, but still, um, here's some good, really good examples of like new uh, transparency is the new normal, the kind of expectations that citizens have in Western democracies. Um, in terms of, you know, back to the, like, the Middle East, I mean, nothing has exposed information in the visual moving sense more, I think, than, than YouTube. I can't remember the exact figures, but it's something like 40 hours of new video uploaded every minute onto YouTube. Um, so, and the role of citizen media, I think the real, the really important thing here in the mobile phone um, with the camera, um, we've been working with a lot of people whose souls, who see as their sole role is to film, uh, uh, to film uh, a, a protests and occurrences and then to get that media uh, up onto YouTube. Governments, of course, are blocking this site all over the world because they don't want it to, um, they don't want information that would otherwise have happened uh, in private to be seen by both people within community and people around the world. Um, and, you know, as many of you guys have, would be <coughs> um, active in, you know, Flickr, uh, again, some of the iconic images that have come out of the Middle East have been up on Flickr. Um, and Twitter, there's a lot of debate, of course, about what role Twitter has played in the Middle East and North Africa, particularly in the Iranian example. Um, <coughs> Uh, my own personal opinion is that, you know, this sort of the microblogging site is, has been absolutely essential in communicating information f to the world. Uh, and increasingly, like in Egypt, for instance, it has been very important to communicate inter-country. Uh, but I, wouldn't have, I would not necessarily call any of those revolutions Twitter revolutions, as has, as has been called. Um, so back to... Um, to WikiLeaks, uh, does anybody see anything odd about that screen grab? Maybe the techies in the room? It's the IP number. I knew you'd be the one to answer. <laughs> so you can see here, that does not say wikileaks.org. Because wikileaks.org looks like that. Because Amazon, who was um, the host for it, decided to take it down because, as you know, um, uh, an American senator rang Amazon uh, and put pressure on them to take that, in, to take that site down. Um, the site actually moved over to wikileaks.ch and from, um, and I tested that this morning, that's a screen grab from this morning. Again, service unavailable. Um, I asked my colleague in Australia to check it and um, he could see wikileaks.ch in, in Australia. So uh, if we think that information is the sort of the, um, that liberation and that information wants to be liberated, uh, uh, there are forces, many forces that are trying to prevent information from being um, released. And so I think this is a really classic example of, uh, and what gave birth, of course, to Anonymous or to the public recognition of Anonymous, that we saw that there were corporate and government interests to keep information withheld. And it's really interesting if you think about this in the American context, because the American government <clears throat> speaks very publicly about the importance of internet freedom over there, you know, in Egypt and in Libya and in Tunisia. But when it comes to uh, information in the US, there are serious question marks. And similarly in Sweden, I might add, um, you know, I'm going to this meeting about internet freedom and the international foreign, you know, the foreign policies that can be in place. And yet there are very questionable policies around data retention here in, in Sweden. 
um, and about surveillance and monitoring of the networks. So one of the things that we've been talking about as an organisation is trying to get a consistency between foreign policy and domestic policy to ensure that transparency does become the new normal as opposed to a system of control um, and a system of concentration of power in the hands of government, but most importantly in the hands of corporations. I think it's important that we recognise that the, that the internet is actually 95% privatised, i.e. The, all of the, the platforms that we operate in, the, the tubes um, that the internet <coughs> um, flows through uh, is 95% privatised. So actually dealing in a very corporatised space. I want to just run through some of the other examples of where I think that this is not just about transparency being the new normal, but perhaps it might be about control um, and security being the new black. Uh, <coughs> and so here's an example. This is, this is Egypt's internet traffic all the way through to January 27. Uh, and that's when the government recognised that man, this internet thing is a big deal and might actually put a regime out of power. And they basically, as many people here know, turn the internet off. But they did it with these guys. Uh, Vodafone is the part owner of one of the four major ISPs uh, in Egypt. And with the consent and the complicity of Vodafone and those other ISPs, they literally took Egypt off the internet map. And um, we ran a campaign actually as an organisation to, and as a network to communicate with Vodafone our displeasure, one, at turning the internet off, two, they're also a mobile operator as we know of shutting down the mobile networks, and then three, ultimately they, excuse me, they ended up sending pro Mubarak messages to their 28 million customers in Egypt. Uh, which was the final straw as far as we were concerned. One was it was about preventing people from communicating and then it was actually reopening the networks in order to send a pro-regime um, text message, a series of pro-regime text messages out. We got about 40,000 people I think to sign that petition uh, in within 48 hours and that enabled us, actually Vodafone contacted us and said we'd like to have a meeting with you. Um, so I said, OK, that's fine, as long as we have an Egyptian blogger on the call. Um, and so we had the four of us, the Director of uh, External Affairs for Vodafone and the Director of Sustainability and myself, an Egyptian blogger. And, you know, they said to us that it was a very difficult and unfortunate decision and one that we didn't want to make, but we were actually confined by the licensing agreement that we had with the government. And it really raised to us this issue of human rights, understanding the, the human rights implications of technology. And I think that the telcos and the web platforms actually have not understood that they're actually now at the front line of human rights defence promotion and, and potentially abuse. And so we really need to ensure that companies like Vodafone and Nokia, um, and Nokia sold interception technology to the Iranian regime, that we have a citizens movement that's actually keeping these guys on their toes, but at the same time, we're also working um, uh, with them all the way from their licensing agreement to the development of the chip to the operation of the network, which there are many decision making points all the way through and making sure that in human rights are incorporated into those decisions. Because otherwise, we are going to be in a situation where the move towards transparency is counteracted by the move towards security and control and corporatization of the internet in an, unaccount in an unaccountable manner. Um, I want to give an example of um, the, I think something that really clearly kind of demonstrates this whole thing that's going on, even though it is very difficult to kind of get a grasp of it um, as a whole. You know, this is the We Are All Khaled Saeed uh, um, Facebook page, which many people probably know is kind of, was a central hub for, uh, this is the English version, um, for e Egyptians. And it was also the site that uh, was shut down at one point because it breached Facebook's terms of service. Basically, Facebook says that unless you um, 
uh, um, honest about who you are, uh, then you can't be you can't use a pseudonym, right? And there's no an anonymity uh, in this either. And so it's one of their it's part of their business model. And we've been saying to Facebook, and we've run a campaign on this as well with a, a number of other calls, is that actually as an organisation, as a platform, you really are on the, the front line of human rights defence. And when you ask people to expose their identity, then you're potentially putting them at risk. And the, the regimes are on a, like, dictators are on a learning curve in the same way a civil society is. They know that if they get access to all of, the, um, all of these people, that they actually have control, potentially, of that network. And one of the things that we've been in a situation with a number of times is people being arrested for their password. Um, because if you have access to the password, you have access to the address book, to communication channels, to networks, etc. And so anyway, um, so we've been asking for pseudonymity, which means that people can be somebody else um, or to pretend to be somebody else. And I think that anonymity is a really important part of the digital sphere and it's really important that we maintain that and there are many many steps all around the world to try and limit an anonymity uh, on the internet and but particularly in the case of activists it's really essential um, so this is what happens as a result partly as a result and you've seen some of these images before of good technology platforms um, and one of the things that happened in relation to Egypt was that um, there was a you know, as you know, um, um, that you know this whole protest actually started with one fruit seller in Tunisia who self-immolated as a result of the crushing poverty and the concentration of power in the hands of the government, and this very public kind of display, you know, slapping on the face, etc., um, of um, by official by corrupt officials, and. And I think many people don't know there was actually a case of a person who self-immolated in another town before that, but it wasn't caught on Facebook. It wasn't captured with a mobile phone and it wasn't shown on Facebook. And that event just disappeared. But that, this event turned into this, you know. And, 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 and so, but we potentially, because of what happened with Facebook, um, you know, that site, those pages might have been down. And then the next step that happened from there is that the, um, the obviously successful protest in Egypt resulted in many of the, some of the protesters uh, storming the state security offices of, um, uh, which was like renowned for housing information and also for torturing dissidents. And in it they found two DVDs or two CDs which had the information and the images of people who are in the state security apparatus. And so those images ended up being put up on Flickr and using the social networks and the platforms to expose the information that had been held very privately and securely by the government. And suddenly you had all of these images up. Um, and this is what you get now when you go to see those images. And I put it up here because, again, it's like the interplay between governments and corporates and civil society. But essentially, it's a, it's a message from Flickr saying that there's been a copyright infringement and those images have been taken down because the person who posted the images didn't, have control, didn't take those images. Um, and I think it kind of shows us, in a sense, the kind of cat and mouse game and the tipping point that we're at where there's a push and a demand for information to be free and it has consequences as well. You know, it has significant consequences, some of which are negative. Um, but, and then at the same time pressures that are trying to shut down those avenues for information. So I think we need to, you know, just in conclusion, I think we need to, I'm just scribbling a few points as I was sitting outside. Um, sort of the battle between, just thinking the battle between transparency and control, um, between openness and security, and between concentration of power and full uh, participation. So I might just end it there. Actually, I won't just end it there because I just want to tell you um, some of the things that 
we are doing in response to try and tip the balance in the right direction. I mean, I think that this, this figure actually is relevant. More than four out of five people around the world believe that internet access is a fundamental human right, and that's even people who don't have access to the internet. But yet, more than 30% of the world lives behind the firewall. And again, I think that demonstrates part of the tension. Some of the things that we're doing, and I'll, I will finish here, uh, is trying to develop new technologies for citizens on the other side of the firewall. Uh, um, to provide thought leadership on the frontier, on the new frontier of digital rights and transparency. And I will say that I think that governments at this point are very confused, and not just governments, governments, corporations, judiciaries are very confused about what to do next. Uh, we've just put together a document which actually sets out what's, what we think states should do next. Uh, but there's a real lack of policy in this area and their pace is moving so quickly. Uh, just, quick, just as an example, in Thailand right now, there's a case um, before the courts, it's two cases actually, looking at the question of intermediary liability, which is basically who is responsible for the content that is put on a site. And if you look at um, in this case in Thailand, basically a woman is, being, is facing 20 years in prison for um, comments that were posted anonymously on her site. I.e., she doesn't know this person, she doesn't necessarily agree with the information, and it's a, it's a critique of the king, which is illegal in Thailand. <laughs> um, but she, as the webmaster, is facing 20 years in prison. So you can imagine what that means for YouTube, for instance. YouTube has no control over the, the videos that are put up. There's a terms of service, for instance, but they don't edit or control or manage or have legal liability. If that case happens in Thailand, that will set a precedent, a very, very significant precedent uh, internationally. <coughs> in fact, it's almost too late because last week, there was the first case was heard and there was a very similar situation where the person who posted the, on their site was actually the webmaster and he has just been sentenced to 10 years for the posting of the comment and three years for hosting it. Um, and so we're, and he is actually in prison as we speak and we're about to launch a campaign to release, to call on the, the Thai government to release him and to change the, the, the um, Computer Crimes Act. And the last thing is the building of the mass global citizens movement because I do think that in many of these instances it's not just about regulation, it's not just about govern, government decision making, it's actually about user interface. And, and I'll just, I, I will finish here, is I just had a, a meeting, uh, I just came from a meeting in Canada where I met a guy who is a security, the lead security guy for a big a major telco in Canada and he said that decisions are being made right now in Canada about the future of the internet, questions like not so much intermediary liability, but technical and policy decisions where the government is just not there. Like the government is not invited, the government has no policy, and corporations are making decisions about the future of our open internet or Canadians' open internet or the one global internet uh, without the presence of government. So I do think it, it is actually up to us. Uh, I think the decisions will be made in the absence of us if we're not present. And there is a lot at stake because the open internet, the, the thing that has created this new transparency or this transparency potentially is the new normal uh, is at risk. And, um, and us as users have the most important stake um, in trying to keep it open. So uh, I might just leave it there. Thanks. Thank you for now. And, um